So <clears throat> why fly fishing? Why not other fishing? I mean, I fished with lures for a long time. And in fact, um, I had a really good friend growing up who was a f dry fly fisherman. He was hardcore. And him and his dad and his older brothers, they'd go out and fly fish all the time. And uh, every year, we'd go, we'd go to my buddy's cabin over on the Duchesne. Some of these fish are from that river. <laughs> um, and we'd fish lures, and we'd just kill it. In fact, on one trip specifically, me and my buddy, not the one who fly fishes, another one who was a lure fisherman like me, uh, we each caught 100 fish apiece in, in a three-hour span just walking that river. It was crazy. And my buddy, who was a fly fisherman, he caught 14 or 15. It was a really good day for him, but you know we were catching hundreds. And so it just never really, it never really appealed to me. It was like, why? why? Why would I waste my time catching 15 fish when I can go get a $20 rod and reel and catch hundreds, you know? So <clears throat> fly fishing changes the game. And you guys are not going to be the 14 or 15 uh, you know, fish catcher person. You guys are going to be the hundreds learning what I'm going to teach you. In fact, we went back. Um, I have my, my one buddy who's the lure fisherman, he refuses to fly fish. He absolutely refuses. Uh, I don't know why. It's just a pride thing, I guess. But uh, I challenged him. I was like, you know what? I'm going to outfish you with flies. You fish your lures, I'll fish my flies. And it was me, my wife, and my buddy who's the dry fly fisherman, and my, uh, a few other friends with lures. Anyway, we outfished them. We, we beat them. It was awesome. <laughs> you know, and it was in that same stretch of water that we had fished growing up. So it was awesome. Um, but fly fishing, it's, it's a reflection of who you are. And I know that sounds all corny and stuff, but it's true. I'm a very competitive person. I mean, I'm kind of high strung and I talk a lot. Uh, you know, I like, I like fly fishing to be, you know, all out. You know, we go out in the middle of winter, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm just, I want to do it, it doesn't matter. My wife, you know, she's a little bit more laid back. She loves summertime and, the, and winter, she doesn't go quite as much, you know. So, so for her, it's a, it's a little bit different game. But it doesn't matter what your personality style, it doesn't matter, you know, where you come from, your background, fly fishing will fit. It will just fit. Um, <laughs> above and beyond just the simple, you know, numbers and catching a bunch of fish, something I've learned with fly fishing is, well, with lure fishing, you can only catch certain fish. Only certain fish will take your, take your lure, but every single fish will take a fly. Every single fish. And, you know, you can stand there for hours and hours and hours fishing to one fish, and eventually you'll catch it. You know, I don't do that. I like to move around and stuff. But, but every fish will take a fly. And so you're, the odds of you catching fish just, they go up. OK, um, so I want to talk to you now about why my buddy, the dry fly fisherman, just didn't have a lot of success. And now I've drawn up here this little diagram to kind of explain it. Um, if you think about it, if any of you are familiar with aquatics biology or anything, which I wasn't at all before, um, <clears throat> in fact, I didn't understand. I remember hearing the, t the, the phrase, match the hatch, but uh, I had no idea what that meant. I remember when I first started fly fishing, and I'd see bugs flying around, and I'd pull out my fly box and run around trying to make sure my fly matched up. And you know, I learned that that wasn't, I, I learned later on that that wasn't match the hatch. Um, what that's referring to is, is aquatic insects, which I guess I knew they existed, but I just never really gave it much thought that there's actually bugs living on the bottom of a river. Anyway, so <laughs> we're going to talk about this in a second, but uh, bugs spend the majority of their life on the bottom of the river. And so this, this chart here shows that about 70% of the time, fish are feeding at or near the bottom. 20% of the time it's mid-water column, and 10% of the time is on the surface. So when you're fishing dry flies, I mean, not only are you dealing with your own ability to present that fly, you're also dealing with the fact that only 10% of the time are fish even looking to feed. And this, this compromises the entire year. Okay, so obviously at any given time when there is a hatch going on, you know, more than 10% of those fish are going to be up feeding on them. But this is, this is the scope of, of, of a year you know, or so of a fish's uh, life cycle. So the majority of the time, they're on the bottom. So it's important that we understand how to get to these fish. Obviously, if they're feeding on, surface, you know, on the surface on dry flies, I'm fishing dry flies. 
But if I go to the river and I don't see any, you know, top action, I don't see any, any, any bugs coming off, you know, I go straight to the bottom. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. A dry fly. We'll talk about that. Um, to give you a little uh, preview, I guess, a dry fly is the adult uh, stage of an aquatic bug. So these guys, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it. So they, they essentially emerge from the bottom. They come out and they, they dry their wings off and, f and fly away. So they're, they're floating on the surface of the water. Does that make sense? That's a dry fly. You're fishing on the surface. You're actually floating a fly on the surface. Okay. So there's a few reasons. The, the, the fact that the food is there is one reason why fish feed on the bottom or are located on the bottom the majority of the time. Another reason is if you think about, think about like a windstorm. If you're standing in a windstorm, what's the safe, where's the safest place to be? It's on the ground. Um, in a river, the water near the top of the water column is actually moving faster than the water at the bottom. So it's actually less stress on the fish, usually, to hang out at the bottom. Okay? And, and it provides, also provides protection. You know, we got however deep the water is, you know, that amount of, of, of protection they feel you know, between them and the surface where a, a bird can come and, and, and eat them or whatever. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why. Okay, so a, a fish, a trout specifically, they are what I like to call economists of motion. Okay, they are going to do the least amount of work for the most amount of food. So obviously if there's more food on the bottom, there's less drag or less, you know, speed of current on the bottom they're going to hang out on the bottom because their, their, their likelihood of getting food is it's much greater. Okay, so here we have a bug, a little nymph. Okay, let's say he's worth 10 calories. Okay, so if a fish is going to eat this bug, okay, and he's Let's say he's floating on the surface. Let's say he, this is a dry with wings. Okay? And this fish is holding clear down at the bottom. This fish, let's say it takes him 20 calories whoa, of energy to consume that, that fly. So obviously, this is a, a bad equation, right? If he, if he keeps eating these bugs, he's going to die. Right, he needs to take in more calories than he's, did I say two or 20? 20. Sorry, I wrote two. Okay, so obviously he needs to consume more calories than he's putting out to attain the food, right? So that's very important to keep in mind. Um, if there's an abundance of dry flies and it's worth it for the fish to stay up on the surface in the faster current or move from the bottom, and, and it, there's enough food up there for them to, to make it worth their, you know, their expended energy, they're going to do it. But most of the time, that's not the case. Okay, so it's important for us to imitate these bugs, you know, floating on the bottom, and to imitate them as close as possible. Now, this is where flies, you know, come into play. Our imitations of flies, you know, you think about it. There's hundreds and hundreds of of bugs, you know, floating by them, and. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have looked at flies, but some of them are pink, some of them are purple, all sorts of different colors. And honestly, I've never seen a pink bug. <coughs> so, you know, fish strike at things for different reasons, but we want to get as close to the naturals as possible to elicit a strike, or basically to just make them think they're just moving over to eat something normal, right? So imagine I'm passing around a plate of potato chips. They're all nice and golden and perfect uniform shape. And right in the middle, there's this big, giant blue one. Is anybody going to eat that blue chip? Probably not, right? So you want to imitate you know, the food they're eating. So you know, flies with pink in them, you know, there's different theories as to why fish strike them. Uh, usually it's not because they think it's food. But you have to realize also, fish don't have hands. So when they're curious about something, they're going to use their mouth. And so you're going to hook up. And that's where lures uh, come into play. It, it's not necessarily they think it's a food organism as much as it elicits a, a, a strike. Does that make sense? And they try it with their mouth because they don't have hands. So let's talk now about specifically about bugs.
Um, there's different terminology you're going to hear uh, as you fly fish. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the different stages of the, the life of a, of a mayfly. Okay? A mayfly is kind of the generic uh, you know, bug that most people uh, think of when they, when they fly fish. It's the mayfly. Okay? So a mayfly goes through a transformation. First off, they start as an egg, you know, this, little, this little speck. But there's no real evidence that fish eat fly eggs, so we're going to ignore that. Okay, so once they, once they hatch from their little egg, they become what's called a nymph. Okay. Okay, so this little nymph, um, and nymphing is what we call fishing on the bottom. Okay. I mean, we'll fish other flies that aren't necessarily technically a nymph, but we'll call it nymphing. So when they start out as a nymph, they can live in this, and this, this varies across species. They live in this form anywhere from weeks to years. Okay? So they'll be crawling around along the bottom for long periods of time. Um, when temperatures are right, the water temperature, the air temperature, there's a lot of different uh, uh, variables that come into play. You know, light penetration, UV penetration, things like that. Oxygen, you know, the oxygen content in the water, all sorts of different variables that come into play that, that make this uh, nymph grow and eventually become what's called an emerger. So let me write here. Okay, so as, um, as this uh, nymph you know, feeds and, and gets enough oxygen, enough light, and all that, it'll start to grow on its back a little, a little wing case. Now, nymphs are, you know, they're insects, so they have an exoskeleton. So inside, they're going to be changing, and they're going to grow this little wing case here, um, and it's actually going to fill with air. And what happens is this, this nymph will become buoyant. And so when the timing's right, you know, when the air temperature's right, all, the, all those variables are right, it will let go of the bottom, and it'll start to, to emerge. Okay, so in fly fishing, you'll often hear this term, emerger. When people are fishing emergers, they're fishing, they're not fishing the surface, they're fishing either right here uh, on the surface film or they're fishing mid, mid water column. So this little guy with his little wing case, he's, he's floating up. And obviously at this stage they're very vulnerable, they're, they're swimming. Now depending on species, depending on, on times of year and all this, um, but mostly on species, these bugs, some just float helplessly, others will actually swim. They'll dart really fast up, and, and those are called caddis, which are kind of an aquatic moth. And those caddis go through a little bit different, um, a little bit different transformation than a, a mayfly. They start out as a larva, and then they pupate, become a pupa, and then they actually grow their wings, and then they swim to the surface. But we still refer to their larval stage and their pupal stage as a nymph. Okay, but again, we're talking about mayflies specifically. So. So as this, as this bug emerges, it'll descend, or ascend, sorry, ascend through the water column. And then, you know, these bugs are real small. And the water has surface tension. So what'll happen is this guy will get stuck here in the surface film. Okay, this stage, if you're fishing, if you're fishing dry flies, this is actually, this and another one, which we'll talk about in a second, is actually the most desirable uh, stage to fish with dry flies because this is when the bug is most vulnerable. This is before it's on the surface, before it can fly away. Obviously, if fish know that these bugs can fly away, they're going to violate this rule, and so they're not going to waste their time as much with bugs that are on the surface. So this is the emerger. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll leave from their exoskeleton, and then they'll emerge onto the surface as an adult. And this, this is what we call the dun, and that's the, the dry fly. That's, that's when it's done <laughs> uh, changing and becomes a dry fly. Okay, so 
after they dry their wings, they'll float down uh, the river or lake or whatever. They'll float until their wings are dry, and then they'll fly away. Um, and again, depending on species, uh, these bugs can be out of the water for anywhere from hours to weeks um, as this, in this done stage. So after they've matured and, um, and all that and they've mated, they actually come back to the river to lay their eggs. Um, so they'll fly back to the river, they'll kind of stick their butt down, lay their eggs, and then they'll die. And then when they die, <clears throat> I'll draw that right here, when they die, they become what's called a spinner. Okay, so this, the spinner, is a dead bug, a dead fly. Okay, so between the spinner and the emerger, just below the surface film, these are the two most desirable ways to fish a dry fly. Okay, so when you're, when you're floating <laughs> A bug right on top, your this 10% really comes into play because you it becomes a big guessing game as to what they're feeding on, whether they're feeding on the dun, the merger, or the spinner, right? And so that's where a lot of the confusion comes in fly fishing. So we've got a lot of guys getting real technical with 10% of the 10% <laughs> of the opportunity when they're missing, you know, these these bigger these bigger uh, opportunities. Okay, any questions about this? Is that pretty cut and dry? That was eye-opening for me when I learned that. I really didn't understand that. You know, I, I knew that my buddy was a dry fly fisherman, but beyond that, I didn't understand. So when I understood this, it it was awesome. I I was I was very happy. Forgot antenna and those guys. <laughs> Got to make them look like the naturals. Okay. So let's talk about the different types of fishing to achieve, you know, fishing these different stages. So <clears throat> first, we have nymphing. And nymphing is what we're doing in this class. We're going to learn how to nymph. I feel nymphing, and for obvious reasons, I feel nymphing is the foundational way to learn to fly fish. Most people start the other way, and they don't discover nymphing for a long time. Because when they do learn about nymphing, it seems very difficult because you use weights, and you have multiple flies, and there's a lot to it, and I'm going to help you get through that. It's not as difficult as it, as it seems. In fact, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, but really, it's, it's, th it's the way to start. Wintertime, like I said, these nymphs live on the bottom of, of the river, you know, anywhere from months to years. And not only do we have, not only do we have you know, the mayfly or stonefly nymphs that are actually going to emerge and fly away, we also have uh, annelids, which are worms. We have leeches. We have scuds, which are a freshwater crustacean. We have sow bugs, which are another crustacean. Um, you know, we have sculpins, which are little fish that die. We have all of these organisms living on the bottom of the river that aren't going to go through this metamorphosis. They're going to stay on the bottom of the river forever. Okay? And so all of that comp uh, comprises nymphing. So whether we're fishing a mayfly or a scud, we're nymphing. Okay? Even though that's not technically a nymph, uh, a scud, it's a crustacean, um, they call it nymphing. So that's the generic term. Okay, so the key in nymphing is getting your flies to the bottom. Okay, and we achieve that with split shot, with weight. Okay, and that's also why we're going to need a strike indicator. Okay, uh, it acts a lot like, like a bobber, um, but it's made of, of yarn, so it's not a bobber. But uh, it floats, you know, on the surface here, and that's going to tell us um, when a fish takes our fly. Because often, oftentimes you're not going to see these fish. There will be times where you can, when you can nymph without an indicator and you can actually just set the hook based on, you know, to see a mouth open or, or other things. But that's, that's pretty technical. So starting with an indicator is the best way to get started. And I rarely fish without one when I'm nymphing. So, and I've been doing it for a while now. Okay. Any questions about nymphing? We're getting to the bottom. Okay. So that's what we're learning here. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. When you're, when you're nymphing, yeah. you've got the line on the bottom, and your opportunity to snag up seems like it's greater yeah. than, than any time other than that. What, what do you think? I mean, is there something that you do so that you can feel whether or not it's just bouncing on the bottom mm -hmm. or whether it's catching? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're going to learn about that. 
Yeah, question? I put my flies at the end. There's a picture of my rigging in there. Okay, but yeah, we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn about rigging. We're gonna learn about um, you know getting down. We're gonna learn about how to know how many weights to put on, and all that. So don't don't worry about that. You'll you'll understand. And I understand. You, you do. You lose a lot of nymphs. It, it happens. Um, <laughs> if I had, I mean, I, I call it paying my tribute to the river gods because every time I go, I I'm I'm breaking off. Yeah, but you know. The, the amount of fish I catch, the amount of flies I lose, it's, it's worth it to me. <laughs> but yeah, we'll learn how to dial that in so that they bounce just right, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so the next, the next uh, stage we can fish is the emerger. And in all reality, um, the emerging stage in the midwater column is very difficult, is a very difficult stage to imitate with a mayfly. Um, most of the time when we're fishing uh, the emerger stage, we're fishing caddis, and we're, we're more, if you think of a trout like a feline, they chase. You know, when they see something moving, the, if they're the right fish, they'll chase. Like that's why lures work. Um, we use that to our advantage when it comes to uh, fishing the emerger stage. Now, a caddis. I talked about a caddis. A caddis will actually swim pretty fast to the surface. Okay, so the way you fish emergers, there's two ways. You can dead drift emergers. So essentially, you're just going to float. Like a lot of people do this. It's called they'll hopper dropper, uh, hopper dropper technique. You don't have to use a hopper per se, but sometimes that uh, a dry hopper, grasshopper imitation is very uh, buoyant. So that's what a lot of people do. They'll put, have a, a hopper, then they'll tie off from the back and put a little nymph. And so they'll fish mid water column that way. But the more common way, and this goes back, you know, centuries, is what's called swinging. Swinging you're going to stand essentially on one side of the river and you're going to cast quartering downstream and you're going to give it a little bit of line. It's called mending, which you don't want to really worry about now. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, but you're essentially going to let it swing in the current. So what happens is if you use a heavy enough nymph or, or a fly, because you're not really using a nymph, I guess, they're called soft hackles. They're going to have a bead on them. They're going to be weighted. So you let them get down and as they swing, um, they're going to lift up. So as it comes around on the swing, it'll lift up. And that lifting motion imitates that caddis swimming fast. Um, and that's a very, very good way to uh, catch fish and elicit strikes. Um, it's a lot of people like to start people with, with fishing um, emergers or swinging. Or they also call it you know, swinging soft tackles or wet, wet flies. Um, it's a great way to get started. Um, the Provo River swinging is great in the fall and kind of early early summer. Uh, we have a lot of caddis coming up, so it's a it's a good time. It's a good time to do that, but not all the time. So when the situation presents itself, I do that, right? Um, okay. So <clears throat> in dry fly fishing, is kind of obvious what it is. It's what most of us are familiar with. You know, we get a little bug, we put some floatant on it, or we put it in some powder to make it float real nice and high. We toss it out there and it floats in the current on top and we hope a fish will, will take it. For fishing defeating fish, we're, our chances are, are much better. But dry fly fishing is actually pretty simple. Um, dry fly fishing where it gets technical is in casting. Because the way you cast uh, determines whether or not you avoid drag. Drag is very difficult for new, new beginners, <laughs> I guess that's kind of redundant, beginners to, uh, to learn because it's very hard. It's, we, you get what's called micro drag. So you can have just a little change in the current and you, your fly will drag a little bit and make it look unnatural and uh, you won't catch fish. So casting becomes extremely, extremely critical in dry fly fishing, which, you know, casting is very, uh, a lot of people tout casting as you know the thing in fly fishing, which is fine. You know I love casting, but I also love fishing and I love catching. So when I fish nymphs, casting is not as it's not as crucial. It's it's a much simpler game. We're only throwing it you know ten feet away. We're not we're not casting too far. You know we're we're a couple of rod lengths away, and so it's not it's not as crucial. So obviously when when situations arise and uh, 
dry flies, you know, the duns are on the surface, I, I fish dries when, you know, I, I see it appropriate. But most of the time, I'm nymphing. So the last way to fly fish, which is very common, is uh, fishing streamers. A streamer is a long fly. Uh, usually it imitates a bait fish or a, a leech. So a woolly bugger, which we're going to tie, uh, imitates, yeah, I have it on the back of the syllabus, a woolly bugger, imitates uh, a leech. Um, now, you can fish streamers just like you fish a lure. Essentially, you toss it out there and strip it back in really fast, like you would a lure. Um, and that's really fun. In fact, a lot of these big fish were caught on streamers because uh, we'll learn about brown trout, but they're nocturnal. And so we fish at night sometimes for these guys, and they're big. So streamers is great. Streamers are awesome. I love streamers because I think it's mostly because I came from you know, lure fishing, and so fishing streamers really speaks to me. But uh, <laughs> I don't do it as much as I'd like because it's just not. Fall's a really good time to do it. Um, you can do it all, all year. But what I really want to, why we're tying a woolly bugger in this class is because you can dead drift a streamer. Essentially imitate a dead leech or a dead sculpin, which is a little fish, and that is deadly. Uh, if a fish can get a big meal that easily, they'll, they'll take every opportunity. So I will nymph streamers a lot. I'll dead drift them. Um, essentially, I'll toss it upstream and let the current just you know, bounce it down. And that's a, an awesome way to fish streamers. OK, are there any questions uh, so far about techniques? Yeah? When you're just talking about fishing streamers, um, do you use an indicator for those? When I dead drift them? Yeah. Yeah, when I nymph them? Yes, I'm using an indicator, but when I'm just throwing them out and stripping them back, no, I don't use an indicator. Uh, yeah, good question. That's usually uh, the depth of the water, too. Some places, that, unless the water is all level, mm -hmm. sometimes you might have like a pothole yeah. in the river, and that sort of changes the whole situation Yeah. about nymphing, because if you have a float on top, the indicator, you have to go change your, the depth of the uh, nymph on the bottom. Yeah, you do have to do that, but not as much as you might think. You fished in Montana in drift boats, right. and they fish that way. A lot of a lot of guys do, but they're not they're not usually fishing on the bottom. They're usually fishing above the bottom. They're usually using their indicator to suspend their nymphs, and and occasionally when the water changes depth, because if you're in a drift boat. You know, you're covering a lot of water, so you just throw it out there and you basically just, you know, you let it go and the water's, you know, it's going to be changing. Um, and so there are, there are going to be times where those nymphs are on the bottom. There's going to be other times where they're not on the bottom. Um, that's not what we're doing. We are going to be fishing on the bottom the whole time. And, and the way I rig <laughs> will help you understand that. And we'll talk about it in night four. But it'll help you understand more how the leader is going to act when the water changes depth. But when you're just waiting, you're usually, you're usually only fishing uh, you know, one, one type of water. And there's not a lot of places here in Utah where you can drift unless you go over to the Green River. But you know, that's another way to nymph that's it's effective. But okay. that's not what we're going to learn here. We're going to learn how to get down to the bottom and keep it there. And then there's adjustments you make with the indicator, with the weights, to get it dialed in based on water depth and stuff. Okay. Any other questions? So like nymphs in Utah behave the same as nymphs in Montana? Mm -hmm. they, oh yeah. This, this, technique, this technique is very friendly to Montana. Um, the way, there, there's different methods like we talked about, you know, and a lot of guys in Montana in drift boats are going to be suspending nymphs. This method is really the best in the western states on bedrock streams where there's, you know, it cuts down to the bedrock. The Green River, for example, is a stream that's silt. And so fishing your flies up off the bottom a little bit, like suspending them instead of dragging them on the bottom, can be more effective. But Montana, yeah, I mean, th I, I'm pretty sure this technique was developed in Montana. Um, but yeah, Montana is definitely a good place to employ these methods for sure. And anywhere. I mean, I've fished all over yeah. the place, yeah. nymphing the same way. But yeah, nymphs are going to, they're basically going to act the same. There, there'll be variations, but you'll figure, I'm going to teach you how to figure out what they are, and you'll be able to find you know, a fly that'll match it. 
OK, any other questions before we move on to equipment? I have a question. Go ahead. If you, you'll, I mean, when you, if you really get into it, you're going to tie your own flies. Mm -hmm. But if you're not tying your own flies, can you, can you find good flies at the, at the stores? Definitely. In fact, I argue that your presentation is way, way more important than your flies. And you'll hear a lot of people say this. You know, fish a fly that you're, you feel comfortable with, that you're confident you'll catch a fish on, because you will. Um, like I said, fish don't have hands, so if it looks like food, they're going to try it. I mean, I've seen videos of fish, you know, underwater taking sticks and leaves and moss and whatever. They take a lot of stuff into their mouth because, like I said, they don't have hands. So your flies that you choose, I mean, there are some very generic patterns, like a hare's ear or a prince nymph or, you know, things like that that are just time-tested, you know, true <laughs> patterns that people have been using forever that will catch fish anywhere. So I wouldn't worry too much about the fly patterns at first. I mean, if you start tying flies, you're going to get really into that, and making your own flies is awesome. But I personally, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a huge, I don't have a huge array of flies that I like to sort through. And, you know, I have my, I have my key flies that I always go to, and... I've never, I mean, obviously when I change rivers, you know, I'll need something different. Do they change during the seasons a lot? Yeah, yeah. The ones that are active will always be changing. They're not all going to be active all at the same time. Okay, but you know, like if you were just fishing here in the Provo, you have, you kind of know what is going to be in the spring. And yeah, you get, you, get a, you get an idea of that, but generally every nymph that's going to be in the stream is in there all year, all the time. There's different, there's different times of year when they hatch or different temperatures of water where they'll, you know, they'll get active. But generally, you know, any, any fly you choose, if you fish it right, you'll probably pick up fish. Now, it's important to dial it in. We talked about the, you know, the analogy of the chips and stuff. It's important to, to dial it in. But you don't have to concern yourself as much. I, I change my flies as little as possible. I mean, if I go for a long time and I know that I'm fishing this patch of water correctly, then, you know, I'll, I'll switch through my flies really fast. But, you know, if I'm up there and I, I've fished the Provo enough that I kind of know. I don't really screen anymore. I don't really look for bugs. I, I kind of just get up there. And that's foolish on my part sometimes, but sometimes I'm just lazy and that happens. So, you know, but generally you can, you can pick 10 or 12 flies, have your box full of those and you'll be good all year. Will you kind of go for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, on the night we talk about bugs, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna bring, I have flies too, I'm gonna pass flies around. You guys will be able to look at patterns that imitate the different bugs. But maybe you're referring to hatches. Like, you can get online and look up hatch charts. Honestly, I don't pay much attention to hatch charts. I do occasionally, but. That just, that just seems overwhelming. Like, when I started to read about all this, it just, like, oh yeah. my God, that's what it is. <laughs> and then, how, you know, they start to hatch here, and where are they at now? Yeah. Some people laugh at me because, you know, they get all technical talking about flies. And I'm not really a technical person when it comes to talking about flies. I'm like, I fished this gray one. <laughs> it works, you know. Because I, I go to the river, I look at the bugs, I tie a fly that looks like that gray bug. I don't care if it's called a Brachycentris hydropsyche or whatever, you know. I'm not into Latin. I've, I've learned a little, but, you know, it's not as important as just knowing when you get to the river how to figure it out. And that's what you're going to learn. 